and welcome. In today's video, I'll be making an Italian Renaissance gamora. A gamora is a dress that has a, well, the dress is behind me in stages of um, construction. It has a high waistline, either right under the bust or a little bit higher than natural than the natural waistline. It has the skirts that are gathered in it that are gathered onto the bodice. It can close either in center front with lacing, in center back with lacing, or at the side backs with lacing, which is the option I've chosen. It also has, as you see here, detachable sleeves. Detachable sleeves were a hallmark of the Gamora, and it allowed for ventilation in Italy's Mediterranean climate. Underneath the Gamora, you would wear a shift-like garment made up of yards and yards of linen, often trimmed with lace or blackwork embroidery, if you were wealthy, called the kamicha. And because of the sleeves that they are separate, they're tied onto each other, then tied on to the bodice, it allowed for the kamicha to pop out in between the sleeves and the bodice. Also, the separate sleeves allowed for great range of motion and if you have another set of sleeves, you pull up it changes look. I'll be using this Margot Anderson pattern. I highly recommend it. This particular Gamora is suitable for the late 15th, early 16th century, so 1490s to 1530s. Now this Gamora is suitable for Working class women, they would wear it out, but for upper class women, women that are more wealthy, they would wear this inside the home. Then outside the home, they would wear two different types of overdresses. One called the Jornia, which is a sleeveless circle that didn't have any uh, side, it was open at the side, so you saw the Gamora um, through it. And then the other one is the Chopa which had sleeves attached to it. It had a very deep V and um, clasped in the center front. Western fashion during this period of time was still highly regional. And a dress that an Italian woman would be wearing is different from a dress that a French woman would be wearing, a Spanish woman would be wearing, or an English woman would be wearing. Even within countries, um, especially Italy, there was even more special regionary, regional variations. For example, a dress during this period of time that a Florentine woman, Florentine woman would be wearing would be different than a Venetian woman or a woman from Naples. This is the farthest I've gone back in history, and so it's been really cool to explore. And I hope you enjoy. The first step was cutting out my pieces from my fabric, an apple green silk dupioni from the IAF Fabric Mart. I had only four yards, so I could only cut two skirt gores, but everything turned out fine in the end. There were six skirt pieces, two bodice pieces, and four sleeve pieces. I then cut all the bodice and sleeve pieces from this brown cotton tulle fabric for stability and structure. I also cut both skirt facings from the twill as well. <laughs> 
see me cutting out the front stiffener layers. Bodices during this time had the bust support worked into the outer garment rather than coming from an under layer like stays. The pattern suggests making this out of paste, a type of stiffened linen, but I didn't have nor want to order any. It did say though that in lieu I could use a sturdy cotton canvas, so I cut the prescribed six layers each about a quarter of an inch smaller than the last to create a smoothly shaped bodice. I then sewed lines about a quarter of an inch away from each other starting at center front to attach all these layers together and to mimic the effects of pad stitching. I then cut away the seam allowance at the arm side and neckline of the bodice front piece which will make the next step easier. I then pinned the front stiffener to the bodice front, laying the innermost layer and the wrong side of the twill together and sewed around the perimeter. I then pinned the twill layer and silk layers of both the front and back bodice pieces and pinned and sewed the shoulder seam. I also cut away the lining seam allowance of the back bodice at the arm side and the neckline. I then ironed the shoulder seam open, folded inwards the seam allowance, pinned it in place, and sewed it down by hand. Here is how that looked once completed. I then folded under the silk layer at the neckline and pinned it to the twill lining. This is why I cut away the twill's seam allowance earlier. It was to minimize bulk in this curvy area and thus make the process of finishing the neckline easier.
Here is how the neckline looked after being finished by hand. I then gave the arm size the same treatment. Although with the arm size, I had to cut into the fabric in order to get it to smoothly wrap over the trill lining. Here is how that looked once completed. I added a little bit of fray check to the spots where I had to clip into the fabric to prevent them from fraying. I then turned the bottom of the bodice inwards by 5 8 of an inch. I didn't cut away the twill lining seam allowance in this area because this is where the skirts are going to attach and I wanted this area to have more heft to support it. I finished it by hand. Here is how the bodice looked once the bottom edges were finished. I then turned the side seams inwards by 5 8 of an inch, then inwards by another 5 8 of an inch. I did this because I wanted this area to be as strong as possible because this is where the dress was going to close via eyelets and I didn't want them to strain the delicate silk in medium weight twill. Like every other edge of this bodice, it was finished by hand. I then marked my eyelets using a friction pen. I marked my eyelets in a spiral lacing pattern, starting with parallel eyelets on the top and bottom, then one close to the bottom of one side and close to the top of one side on the alternate side of the bodice, then spread them out about half an inch from there. I then punched a hole for the eyelets using a size 00 tool and a rubber mallet. Here are how the eyelets looked once sewn. There are 10 eyelets on either side of the bodice and one eyelet at each shoulder seam for sleeve attachment. Now that the bodice was done, I moved on to the skirt. I pinned the front panel to the skirt gore. Remember, I only have two instead of four due to fabric limitation. I then pinned the back panel to the other side of the skirt gore. I then sewed those seams together by machine. After the seams were sewn, I ironed them open, trimmed one side of the seam down, then folded the untrimmed seam allowance in on itself, covering the raw seam allowance, and thus finishing the seam. This finishing process results in felt seams.
then whip stitch the seams down by hand. Now that the skirt was seen together, I turned my attention to the hem of the skirt. I pinned a 5 inch strip of silk and cotton twill to the skirt. This will form a facing. I used a layer of cotton twill to add strength to the hem of the skirt and to help it stand out. I then attach the hem facing by machine. facing was then given a quick trim with pinking shears. The seam allowance is then ironed towards the hem facing. I then understitch the facing, meaning I stitch as close as possible to the hem of the skirt on the facing side to help it turn inwards properly. I then gave the cotton twill layer of the facing a little trim so the silk layer would cover it. This upper edge of the silk layer was the fabric selvage, so I didn't have to worry about finishing this edge. I then iron the facing inwards and pinned it in place. Facing was then sewn by hand. Here you see me pinning together the skirt facings right sides together. After they were sewn, I clipped the curves and turned the facings right side out. For the top of the skirt, I cut another strip of cotton twill, this time 3 inches wide, to bulk out the pleats at the top of the skirt. Here you see me marking a line half an inch away from the bottom of the strip using Taylor's chalk. I then turned that edge inwards and sewed it by machine. 
After the strip was hemmed, I pinned it right sides together to the top of the skirt and sewed it by machine. Here you see me placing my skirt facings right sides together. I placed mine different from where the pattern suggests. I placed them in the middle of each skirt gore so I would have an equal amount of fabric for both the front and back of the skirt. After the skirt facing was sewn, I cut down my sewn slit and ironed the facing inwards. I didn't tack down either the skirt nor the top facing because it wasn't necessary. Now it was time to attach the skirt to the bodice. I used the divide and conquer method. I folded my bodice in half and marked it with the pin. Then in half again and again until I had 15 pins or 16 sections. I repeated that process with the front section of the skirt. I then matched those pins together and pleated the remaining fabric in between those pins. The center was a box pleat, then knife pleats radiated towards the sides of the bodice. I then used four strands of thread and a lot of force to whip stitch the bodice and skirt together. I highly recommend to use a buttonhole thread if you can, I just didn't have any that would match. I was going through six layers of fabric here. Here's how that front looked once the bodice and the skirt were attached. I then repeated the divide and conquer method for the back panel and the back skirt. Here I am pleating the back panel which will have bulkier pleats due to the fact that the back panel is narrower than the front which means the pleats will be more condensed. Now that the main dress was done, it was time to tackle the sleeves. I cut away the top twill seam allowance, then turned the silk seam allowance inwards and pinned it in place over the twill. Then folded the bottom of the sleeves inwards by 5 eighths of an inch. This was done for all four sleeve pieces, two top pieces and two bottom pieces.
edges were then sewn by hand. Here you see me marking the sides of each sleeve piece by 5 eighths of an inch, then a line 5 eighths of an inch away from that. This is the same thing I did earlier with the sides of the bodice. I wanted the sides to have more layers of fabric in them to support the eyelets that will be sewn in them later on. The sides of each sleeve piece were then ironed inwards and pinned, then sewn down by hand. Here is a picture of how the pieces looked once all the edges were finished. I then marked the eyelid placement using friction pens. It is hard to see here, but there are three eyelids on each side of the sleeve piece, about half an inch away from the edge of the sleeve. One near the top, one near the bottom, and one in between that. I also marked an eyelet at the center of the bottom of the top sleeve, and at the center of the top of the bottom sleeve piece where the two sleeve pieces would join. There was also an eyelet marked at the top of the sleeve at the shoulder joint where the sleeve would join to the bodice. All 30 of these eyelets were then sewn with three strands of matching DMZ embroidery floss. This combined to the 22 eyelets on the bodice makes 52 eyelets in total. Here is how the sleeve pieces looked once all the eyelets were sewn. Now that the dress was done, I had to work on the attachment method, braided cord. I cut 18 inch lengths of cord for each sleeve attachment point, so 16 in total. Then cut two lengths of 36 inches for each side closure. I coated the ends in the E6000. Please wear gloves, folks. You really shouldn't be getting this stuff on your hands. I then pushed the glue coated ends into the aglet. I used 38 in total. Sometimes I had to use an awl to push the ends of the cord inward. I then used some needle nose pliers to crimp the ends of the aglet close around the cord to further secure it. Here are the sleeves all laced together. Each sleeve attachment point was tied into a simple bow. Here I am lacing the bodice closed. I used a spiral method. Here's how the bodice looked once laced. Everything I've mentioned in the video as well as the accessories I'm wearing in the reveal will be linked below. Hope you enjoy!